Well, a good morning, and no need to check your clock. We are running 30 minutes ahead of schedule today here on the Gardener's Corner program. We are live on the scene at T.G. Brooks Company. We try to come out here a few times a year to uh, spend time with Bill and Roy and their friendly staff here at T.G. Brooks. They always welcome us in with big smiles and we just enjoy it right here at 411 Helena Mariah Road. Um, they are a small business that caters to many different needs. People, a person, Granville, Orange, Durham County. They kind of right here amidst uh, yeah, yeah. all four yeah, counties. Yeah, and yeah. so definitely a landmark in business since 1936. Our special guest today on the program is Mr. Johnny Coley of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service, where he is a horticultural agent that serves person in Granville counties and does a mighty fine job at it. Now, Johnny. That's all I'm he gonna, asked, bro. That's right. That's <laughs> right. I'm going to uh, uh, mention our sponsors in just a little bit, but uh, we're going to see if you have studied for the quiz. And the quiz is, what does the TG mean here at TG Brooks Company? Again, in business since 1936, 411 Helena Mariah Road, so tick tock, tick tock, like the Jeopardy theme. Jeopardy. So, okay, you uh, what's your answer? Uh, is this my final answer? Your final answer. <laughs> Thomas Gold. There you go. Thomas good Gold. job. Uh, good job. Thing. Good job. So, you, 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 we go. We go. Put a star that. beside of your Thank name. You. Yeah. Ask that on on a regular basis so I don't forget. Cause that's uh, that's right. <laughs> Want to let you know that we're brought to you today, of course, by T G Brooks Company. Brought to you by Rusty Wagoner with Linder Turf and Tractor. If you're in the market for a new Kubota, whether it's a tractor or more, an excavator or skid steer, contact Rusty Wagoner with Linder Turf and Tractor. They are located up in Burlington. We'll share some information with you about those fine folks. Also, Fun Wood Auctions. They're having a consignment auction sale. It will be the last Saturday of this month. That will be the 27th. And the consignment auction is going to be taking place up at Camp Springs Bluegrass Park. It's in the edge of Castle County, but it actually has an Elon mailing address. They are accepting consignments. We'll tell you about that. And we'll share some information with you from South Boston Memorial as a fine supporting sponsor of us here on the Gardeners Corner program. Again, it's the early extended edition. We'll be here till 12 o'clock. But uh, got to make a statement. I called my friend Johnny Coley yesterday, and I said, Johnny, I said, are you all set up and geared up for T.G. Brooks Company tomorrow? And he said, I am, Rob, looking forward to it. I said, well, Johnny, I said, I don't think we're going to have to worry about any snow the weather is supposed to be nice. Well, from where we're sitting at right here in the shade around the corner, the way the wind is blowing, I wouldn't expect, I would be surprised up, if we don't be... see a few snowflakes. Yeah, if it clouds up, we better be careful. Uh, I think it could come. Uh, last come. night was, I think we were 37 this morning at the house. Oh, it got down to 34 at, at the uh, yeah, Person yeah. County Airport, which is just a rock's throw from here across uh, uh, 501, so, but uh, anyway, uh, T.G. Brooks Company, they've got a lot of vegetable garden plants here ready to go, and uh, I just talked with a fella a few minutes ago, and he said that uh, being out early this morning, he said he saw quite a bit of frost on some rooftops. Oh, yeah, now, I don't doubt it. I, don't I, doubt I didn't see any, but I was at the station you know, uh, about 520 this morning, and so I, I didn't see any frost. But, you know, Johnny, uh, it's still dark at 520, so you can't see it. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Hey, I, at that time in the morning, I, I do good just getting me into the radio station. Yeah. But, but, but we are live here at T.G. Brooks Company, and we're going to be sharing a lot of good information. Here it is, uh, April the 16th. 
And typically in our region of the Piedmont, after April the 15th, our chance of frost decreases pretty rapidly from now on out to the end of the month. Now, of course, you know it's always the exception. And you know the old expression in North Carolina when you talk about the weather. If you don't like the weather today, hang around about three days because it's surely going to change. <laughs> change <for you. laughs> and that's the case all except for July and August. I know, like. it. it's just, I know it. It's just I hot know. and sunny but and humid. But, well, yeah, you're right. It's uh, It does decrease quite a bit, Rob. Twenty um, April 20th is about the date we've, we've landed on now, especially for this area. But the 15th has always been the date because that's, that's the tax day. And, of course, this year they moved the tax day. So yeah, we, <laughs> yeah. Um, Hopefully they didn't. Hope the frost date didn't move along with that. I guess that's what you call a month of reprieve. I guess, but I, guess I agree right. with you. I hope they didn't move the frost date. Yeah, yeah. Although last year, if everybody remembers, last year May tenth we had a frost. We had a frost on May tenth. It was Mother's Day uh, Sunday morning, Mother's Day. We had a frost last year, um, and so uh, you know, keep keep your your uh, covers handy for your for your plants. And that's what I told people. I did a vegetable garden and. Um, workshop or, or webinar on Wednesday <clears throat> and yeah, I told people then uh, you know that last night I think last night was supposed to be the coolest of this little snap here I think night's going to be cool but not as as cool but uh, but don't put your your frost protection up yet because it, it's still likely to, to get a little cool and, and tomatoes I've got some uh, some beautiful tomatoes sitting over here to my right and um, you know they don't like it much below 50 really so uh, not that you need to cover them up if it's below 50, but they're not going to do a lot of growing at night. If if, um, uh, if the nighttime temperatures get below 50, they're not going to do a lot of a lot of growing. So, you know, it's still still plenty early to uh, to to get your plants planted, uh, your peppers and uh, tomatoes and your your warm season crops is you know still a touch early. But you know the weather we had last week and the week before, you know, it's hard to. Uh, Hard to, to resist. Go. That's right. After winter, you know, you, you're ready to get out there and, and start planting your plants. And, um, you know, I understand it's, it's it is difficult, but it, it it's always uh, you know smart to wait a little little while unless you have some protection, unless you can cover them up uh, um, and and protect them from the frost. But um, it, you know, you just wait till first of May, and then <laughs> normally you, we're okay. Last year was an exception to that. So. Well, you know, Johnny, I, I, I pick at you a lot about how, your love of tomatoes and how much you, you know, like to make sure that we have a bountiful crop. Yeah. And I think about the saying that you said your dad used to say, and that was? You can plant tomatoes first of April, you can plant tomatoes first of May, but you'll have tomatoes about the same time. That's right, because, that's right. Because of how they grow. And that's a that's a case. It, you know, a lot of people like to start out with with larger plants too. You know, they'll plant a gallon container, and um, you know, if you plant a gallon container and now, you know, you you'll have tomatoes. You know, a little bit earlier than that, but it's 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 all about the the, the temperatures and how how fast they'll grow. You know, they just don't get established as well in, in cooler like we're having today. Even I mean, they they just, just don't grow as as well. Yeah, for some of our listeners, it's from down around maybe the uh, Oxford stem button area. For those of you that are maybe not familiar with Johnny Coley, uh, Johnny's family were the owners and operators of Coley Bunch Nursery for a great number of years. And uh, Johnny's done some uh, school teaching, been a school teacher and done other things. And when Mr. Carl Cantalupi retired, uh, Johnny was hired on to take Carl's place. And how many years has it been now, Johnny? Um, about four and a half years. Four, four and a half, half years. years yeah. that, that'd be rolling around you. Your hire on day was in December, wasn't it? December 1st, yep. December wow. 1st was uh, Time uh, 2016. Time flies it, it does, and stay busy. And it's always, it's been busy, and I have had fun. I tell everybody I love my job. I just wish I was better at it. And, you just uh, hang around sorry. and see what's going <laughs> to happen next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and speaking of Carl, uh, Carl had a... Um, a webinar. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't. I don't. Probably wasn't Carl's first webinar, but um, I think it may be one of his biggest ones. He had uh, quite a few participants at a um, asparagus webinar. He had uh, back about a month, a month or so ago. I forget now the exact date. It was actually it was on March 17th. I think it was on St. Patrick's Day. He had uh, asparagus workshop 
uh, it was through the Pennsylvania State Extension. Penn State. Uh, through Penn State Extension. So um, he did a you know did a did a great job as he always. I understand does. he had close to 400 people. He had uh, close to 400 signed up. I don't think that many were actually on the uh-huh. on the uh, the Zoom um, webinar that day. But yeah, he had it was uh, approaching 500, I think, as far as actually registrations. Right. But with as we're finding out. Um, Registration doesn't mean attendance. That you know, people will register and then either they forget about it. We or all have good up. intentions. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, and um, but he did a you know did an outstanding job and learned a lot about asparagus. Uh, of course, Carl has has done a lot of research on asparagus through the years and uh, got some new varieties coming out of Canada uh, that are that are competing yield wise with uh, the Jersey varieties, uh, the New Jersey varieties that have come out uh, that Carl was really promoting for a number of years but the uh some of the varieties coming out uh, or have promised to to be even better yielding than those so that's you know it's always a changing thing in the plant world um and i had and i may probably made this comment before uh i had a professor one time said you could study azaleas your whole life rob he's just azaleas and the day you passed away they will come out with a new variety that you didn't know anything about so you know if you just this if you very specialized in, in something uh, even even that you have a hard time grasping in the plant world. So it's a very uh, very broad spectrum um, area to and, and it's never a dull moment for sure. Well, we're live here at T.G. Brooks Company. Johnny Coley is our special guest. Uh, Johnny, uh, you know a lot of grass has been mowed over the last several weeks or so. Grass is growing pretty well. Um, and you know, it seems like whenever a lot of you weeds were mowed too. Well, yeah, I was gonna and... say, <laughs> you know, when you when you kind of clip it back, you know, you think say, you know, it looks good, it's green, looks good. That's right. Well, then in a day or two, you see all these dandelions and other weeds <laughs> that just grow up. It makes it look like you hadn't even you know mowed the lawn or anything. Well, it's all your perspective of, of weeds now, Rob. Because I I did a talk to the, um, uh, the beekeepers of Associ- uh, beekeeper association in Person County sponsored a, a class uh, a, a few weeks ago, and I I, uh, I did a, a talk during that class about plants that bees like. And usually when I'm talking about dandelions, I'm talking about how to get rid of the dandelions. Well, bees like dandelions. Oh, they so, do. Yeah, so that's a good pollinator source for for the bees. So, you know, if you have a field of dandelions and you have a, have a beehive, that's probably something you don't want to mow. But uh, well, anyway. You, you know, and I think maybe you was the one that told me the uh, meaning of a weed, and, and that, in fact, is a plant that is growing where you don't really want it to be growing yeah, at. Exactly. So... You know, it, it all is all your perspective of weeds. But I tell people that they ask me if I have a, a, a wildflower garden or a pollinator garden. I say, well, my front yard would probably qualify for that <laughs> because there's a lot of wildflowers out there. Well, uh, but anyway, with that being said, is it too late to put out any maybe uh, uh, thing to kill dandelions and other? yard weeds and fescue lawns or you just kind of didn't miss that window of opportunity well it, it's not too late to put out your post-emergence rob uh pre-emergence yeah you're you're a little late on the pre-emergence of course now you would be putting pre-emergence out for your for your summer weeds and uh, a lot of them have already germinated at this point so you wouldn't you wouldn't get a lot of control with your uh your pre-emergence on your on your weeds um, but for your your weeds that are already up like dandelions the post emergence you can still do especially with your broadleaf weeds uh you, you can get your post emergent herbicides out there uh if you have any of the the broadleaf weeds the the you know the cool season broadleaves like your uh chickweed hembit dead nettle um they're going to be dying pretty soon on their own uh you know you could spray them if they were in an area you're trying to clean up clover is something that you know a lot of people don't like to have in their yards. And you can spray that with a, um, 
a broadleaf herbicide that's more of a selective herbicide. It won't, you know, it will not hurt your grass. It'll just kill the broadleafs in there. But just, you might want to do an inventory of your grass before you, you start doing that and see how many broadleafs you have. Because a lot of times people will, will put out a broadleaf herbicide and all of a sudden they don't have anything green in the yeah, yard anymore. Yeah. Cause it, so look and see how, what percentage of broadleafs you do have before you start killing all the broadleafs. And, um, make sure that you're okay with with getting rid of those those broadleaves because a broadleaf herbicide uh, is usually going to get most all the broadleaf herbicides and another thing I always caution people on with the broadleaf herbicides is that they, most of our plants in our landscapes are broadleaf um, and I'm looking across the road here I see some it looks like hydrangeas beginning to, to uh, come up over there and if you know you put a pre you put a, po a post emergent uh, broadleaf herbicide on hydrangeas, um, hollies, lower petalums are beginning to, to pop out, hostas, anything that has a broad leaf, it's, it doesn't know that it's not a weed, so it's yeah. going to try to kill it. So just be careful when you, especially spraying liquids, and there are some granular formulations out there as well of the broad leaves, but uh, if you're spraying a liquid, just, you know, a windy day is not a day to, to spray a herbicide. Uh, even if it's a, a, a selective herbicide like some of the broadleaves are. Right. Well, Johnny, uh, the, you, you are 100 percent correct, and I've heard a lot of people say that it's always a good idea for you to get out in your lawn and, 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 and just do a survey to get an idea and uh, because it's one of those things I think a lot of times uh, – my, my family, you know, question sometimes when I mow the grass why I don't cut it any shorter than I do. And I said, well, I said, I'd like to have it about, you know, three and a half inches tall. And, you know, hopefully, you know, when you leave your, your, your cool season grasses, you know, at least three and a half inches tall, it is a chance that they can help shade out and kill some of the weeds yeah. but when you scap your lawn yeah. you're just inviting weeds to grow and the thing is uh, when it's good moisture in the ground the grass grows well but when it's bone dry weeds grow real well and the grass not so much so yeah 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 I mean fescue and your fescue is our main cool season grass that we have in this this area I mean, there's lots of different varieties of fescue but you don't want to mow your fescue very short I mean, three and a half inches is great three and a half to four inches is, is optimum uh, on the fescue your warm season grasses you can cut shorter the Bermuda uh, probably the, the the number one um, warm season grass in this area would be Bermuda uh, but you have zoysia Maybe some centipede. Centipede is right on the borderline of its hardiness in this area, but um, it's a very little centipede. But the uh, the cool, the warm season grasses you can mow mow shorter, but cool season, as you said, three and a half inches, it's just going to do better. If if you start getting it lower than that, it's not going to perform well, and then that's when the weeds start to take over. Well, now again, we're broadcasting live here on the Gardener's Corner program from T. G. Brooks Company. We started up about 30 minutes early, and we'll be here till 12 o'clock. We're going to be talking with Bill and Roy coming up in a few minutes about uh, some of the different uh, Fertilone products that they carry here at T.G. Brooks Company. Uh, they have mulch. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are needing gardening supplies, you would be surprised at all the different things that are available here at T.G. Brooks Company. But right now, we're going to get a word on for Fun Wood Auctions. Kenneth Smithy is having a consignment auction sale, and you can turn those unwanted items of yours into cash. They will be accepting items next week. Here's more information from Fun Wood Auctions. Good morning, Rob. Roy, how are you? How are you, sir? Good. Roy, doing all right this morning? Y'all, you ready to talk with us a little we'll bit? Let Bill talk first. Well, tell him come on around if he's ready. I'll get him right now. And look, 
Y'all got any 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 uh any ice melt or snow sled? Yeah, we put you in the shade out here in the cold. Isn't it? I swear. Look, I told Johnny yesterday when I called him. I said, Johnny, I said I don't think we got to worry about no snow at T.G. Brooks this time. But I'm gonna tell you, in the shade away that we whip it. She look cool. But that's good. We want to worry about executive decision. <laughs> I see him sitting over there in the sun. In the sun, yeah, with the sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is nice. You know, yeah. just some are never satisfied. All righty, here we are back. Bill, if you will, grab that chair right over there, and uh, we're going to get Mr. Bill Brooks on there with us. And let's see, yeah, Bill, if you want to come on, i tell you, Johnny, you just fly this way. And uh, anyway, Johnny, you've had your COVID vaccinations, yeah, had you? Yes, I, I had just, mine too, boy. Bill had his, and I just had my second one. So if I go to acting... You know, uh, unruly or unjust, I'll just push me out of the way and just claim it it's a vaccine how, how reaction. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm glad you said that. How we know? <laughs> anyway, Mr. Bill Brooks, one of the owners of T.G. Brooks Company, is here with us right now. And, uh, Bill, I was uh, just uh, kidding Roy a little while ago about asking if y'all had any ice melt or snow sleds and from right here where we're at, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see a few flakes of snow. It's cool in the shade, isn't it, Johnny? It is a little bit. There's not a cloud in the sky, though. I think we might be safe. I yeah. think we've got some snow sleds. <laughs> <laughs> got a few snow sleds. I'll get an ad in right there, but we do have a few snow sleds. And any time you want a snow sled, they have them right here at T.G. Brooks Company. Bill, y'all are geared up, ready for springtime. you got some beautiful plants. Yeah. Uh, from my vantage point, I see some better boy tomatoes. What are some of the other varieties of tomato plants you have? Uh, the better boys, of course, the always German Johnson is always a popular one. Uh, we have the big boy, the big beef. Uh, I, celebrity, normally, I think we're out of celebrities right now. And That's a good tomato. You've got the cherry tomatoes and the super sweet 100, which is absolutely probably one of sweet my favorites. Sweet 100s, they are delicious. Uh, I eat them just like by the handful when I walk by the plant, you know. And, and I see one over there that I, I recognize by the leaf. The only tomato I can tell from the other ones is brandy wine, and I see that one over there. Brandy wine <laughs> is here, and it is a distinctive uh, plant. It, it does tell you what which it is. which one is that, Johnny? It's the, the second one. Second one, one from the left. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. And you say that's a brandy wine. It's an heirloom tomato, an old style tomato, uh, and they they are good. They no doubt they, about yeah, it. Yeah, they won the taste test for a number of uh, years, I think. But they're not the prettiest tomato in the world. No, they're not. But they make a heck of a good tomato sandwich. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Ain't nothing no better than a homegrown tomato sandwich, which, except for Johnny, he doesn't agree <laughs> with that. But anyway, we won't hold that against you. Well, now, so you got got a good variety of tomato plants. What I else have you got, Bill? We've got some squash, brook neck, straight neck, uh, zucchini, a uh, couple of different varieties of cucumbers, uh, one of them being the uh, Burpless Supreme, which is your Burpless Cucumber that's so popular. Uh, and then we've got some, quite a few peppers, jalapenos, cayenne, habanero, and we've got a couple of different uh, bell peppers, green. I think it's some yellow bells, some red bells. Orange bells. I didn't know so many colors of bell peppers until we <laughs> got into the plant business. So, yeah. well, and even then, a multicolored one uh, they have too. I don't know if we've got those yet. Wow! So, um, folks can come out here and buy the plants and and have the garden planted in, in, in no time. Now I'm gonna ask a crazy question. We always talk about corn, you know, cross pollinating. If you say you've got a white variety and you plant a sweet variety of yellow, it can you know cross pollinate. Now, you talk about those colors of peppers. Can they cross-pollinate? The seeds you get from those might come back different. Okay. But okay. they don't usually, um, you don't usually have a have, have the, a different 
color on the plant that you planted. If it's if it's a red variety, it's going to be red. But the seeds you get from that, if it's close to a, a yellow variety, you might have some okay. seeds All in right. there. So that's, that may sound like a crazy question, no, but I, I just know. had that I'm thought. I'm a question for Johnny because I was – I'd always heard too that like cantaloupes and melons can possibly cross. I, I have heard that. I don't think it's it's an I've exception. I've never seen it happen, but yeah, I've, I've heard people talk about it. It's an exception to the, than than a rule. I've had some people say that, and and even with the corn, corn doesn't do that a whole lot because I mean they plant varieties of corn in trials. You know they'll be right beside each each. You other, know how I feel about sweet corn. It's all good. The first available. Is <laughs> That's right. right. I agree with you, Rob. I had uh, I tell a, a story about that a, a guy was um, running a farm not too far from here in, in uh, southern Granville County, and they were doing a trial. They were doing a, a corn trial, and um, the, the gentleman that was supposed to tag the, the varieties didn't do it, or he, he mixed them up, or something happened with the tags as, as far as the varieties go. And um, the guy said, well, how are we supposed to tell the difference, you know, of which variety of what? And he says, well, if you can't tell any difference, it must not be any difference. <laughs> so, Good uh, answer. Good answer. <laughs> Well, now, speaking of corn, do y'all sell uh, sweet corn? Oh, yes. uh, You do? Okay. We have four or five varieties of that. Uh, of course, we have Silver Queen, which still outsells everything else put together. And we have the Silver King in a white corn, which is a really good corn, too. Uh, uh, like, And I agree with you. The first one I get is the one I like the best <laughs> yeah, at the time. Yeah. And then we have some um, yellow corn, and we actually have a bicolored corn, which is white and yellow mix. I've heard that called peaches and cream. Yeah, the one we've Ambrosia. Got serendip serendipity. Yeah. Serendipity. And we've had all those you just mentioned too in the past. It just gets to the point you can't stock all of them. <laughs> well, you know? Now, you know, Bill, you are a stew connoisseur. I know you folks out here at uh, T.G. Brooks has been known to cook a Brunswick stew or two. Now, a lot of people around here they don't like yellow corn in a Brunswick stew. Very true. They want that shoe pig white corn. And, you know, it has gotten to where you used to it's could fine. buy the shoe pig corn in the can, but you can't, but you can buy it frozen. And then I've heard some people complain about the shoe pig corn that you buy that's frozen. It's kind of tough. Now, with me, I don't care if it's yellow or white. I like it either way. But now... If you're one of these connoisseurs that has to have, you know, the sheep pig white corn in your stew, plant some, cut it off and freeze it, and it'll be ready when you are. Also, I got to ask this question. Yes, sir. Have y'all ordered any mason jars or canning jars? We've got a booking order in that's been in for quite a while. And we get a few along. It's kind of, I don't understand the process of how one week we get two of this type and two of that type. It's a very slow trickle effect on the jars. As far as the lids and the rings, we have got nothing. Now they're booked and everybody keeps saying, we're gonna get them. But as of right now, they're not here. And I've, wow. I've taken the position on a lot of other things we sell lately that just because it's showing an in inventory, or you order it doesn't mean you get it. Yeah. I look at. I want to look at it because there's so much stuff out of stock, from the hardware to the canning supplies to uh, you know there's different mulches that are getting just about hard to get. Wow. Because I think that the mulch people are having difficulty getting the chips, particularly the dyed mulches. I guess the building industry is consuming most of it. So wow. you know it's 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 one it's it's a lot better than it was last year as far as the immediate impact, but it's still a lot of stuff out there. Well, it. And, it, and the price is, as we will what up, Yeah, well, I, I remember last year, it was a lot of people looking for canning jars and, and couldn't find them, and then yeah. the jar tops and lids. You know, one, one thing about the, uh, the, the screw-on tops, you can reuse those, but the seals, yeah. you know, you yeah. can't yeah. reuse those. No, and so, a, you know, if you've got jars, keep them wash them don't throw them away and i think last year the whole thing hit that the people that manufactured all the jars knew basically what they sell every year so that's what they made and then when the impact of the COVID hit last year and everybody planted gardens that never had planted a garden all of a sudden it was gone well that's like you all with, with, with all your vegetable garden plants 
Y'all have an idea of about what y'all will be able to sell. And, and, and you know, you don't want to double the amount that you have ordered, you know, to, to order the double amount and have to throw them away. Okay. But now, uh, it was a lot of gardens planted this past year that people had never had planted a garden. Oh, Lord, and yeah. I'm sure it'll be a lot of gardens planted this year as well. Yeah. But, you know, one thing that we have talked about a lot, Johnny, it doesn't take a very big area to provide enough fresh vegetables for you to eat. And, you know, if you plant an abundance of that, you know, that creates a lot of hard work. Yeah, it, it does. sure does. It does. So, I, but I've all, always say that the easiest part of a garden is planting it. No you doubt. Know, no plant, doubt. Planting it and, and then the care afterwards. You're just getting started when <laughs> you right. plant it. And, that's right. And that's something we have, you have to realize. But, yeah. you know, we, I think you'll see a lot of gardens planted this year, but I think it's not going to be the, the panic buying that we saw last year. Right. You know, where it just wiped out everything so quickly. So I think the supply is fairly adequate on that end. Now, jars, I, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know. My crystal ball doesn't tell me that, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, I understood they did make more jars this time. Right. So hopefully, but it's, you know, last year I couldn't even get a canner, and we've got canners. I've got three of them in the store right so now. So you got, got canners. We've got some canners, them. but last year you couldn't get a canner for anything. I mean, you couldn't even go online and get them to tell me. It was just crazy. Yeah. Sorry, but we're hard to get production started right then. It's sort of like the, the nursery business, the, the plant business. You know, it's not like you can just go out and you can't raise get them. them overnight. That's right. No. You got it takes a little while, you know, for woody ornamentals. I mean, some some woody ornamentals it takes, you know, 3 to 5 years to get it up size to, to put out in the yard. You know, some of my builders that we do business with are telling me, and I, I don't know anything about that end that you're talking about, and you know a lot about it. The ornamental shrubbery is difficult to get. You yeah. know, that when they build these houses and they need to landscape and put shrubbery in, they're traveling three and four different nurseries to wow. get what they need. They say, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. difficult it's, there too. A lot of people last year by being home, they, they did some landscaping around the house and that just, it took a lot of the inventory down. And as I said, it, you can't just replace that inventory no. overnight. It, it takes, takes several years. Yeah. yeah. But now, Bill, another question now, here, here on our table, uh, you've got some, some different products. And I was talking to Johnny a little while ago about, you know, you can, you know, mow the grass today and two days later. <laughs> yeah, certainly. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, what are some of the products that, that that's being displayed on our table today? Honestly, I don't know what he put out there. <laughs> First one I'm looking at is Kills All, which is a uh, glyphosate, and it's 41% uh, strength, which is the maximum that we can sell, and it. You know, it's a great, it's a generic uh, product that works just as well as anything we've ever used. And uh, you put two ounces of that in a gallon of water, most everything is going to make it die. Uh, it's not very good on woody plants, shrubbery, uh, briar, stuff like that, but it will it will get any grass product most of your common weeds. And then we've got some garden and farm insect control. Uh, it has a picture on it of tomatoes, a dog and a Holstein calf. Uh, tell us a little bit about this product. It's a broad spectrum insecticide that you can practically use on anything. It's probably the safest uh, one out there that we can sell or left. It does a good job on most of your garden insects and pests. Maybe it'll work on some of your worms, but it's not really made for that. Then you normally go to another product. But uh, that right there is uh, you know, a great product for your garden. Uh, that's permethrin. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, now you mentioned a while ago that you've got a good variety of squash plants here. The squash vine borer, uh, that is something, if you wait till you see the effects of it, it's, it's too, too late. late. Exactly. So, w what is recommended, Johnny, to battle the squash vine borer? Well, that is a tough one, Rob. Uh, the, the squash. You see the eggs, eggs will be the first thing. Scouting is your primary thing with the, the squash borer um, because you see it. Uh, well, actually, you know what? I'm getting my squash borer and my squash bug mixed up. Uh, the, squash, the squash bug is what you see the, um, the, 
the, the eggs. The squash bore. And that'll be on the back side of the leaf. The back is that side right? of the leaf, yes, sir. Yeah, and um, and they can multiply very quickly. The, the boar, uh, that's actually a moth that, that lays that eggs and lays it right at the base of the plant. And uh, yeah, they're they're very difficult. I mean, you can dust it with a um, uh, or, or spray it with a dye pail or, or BT uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, you sure didn't say that easy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't you make did me well smell it. Don't one. make me smell it. But I, uh, it's it's a uh, uh, it's gonna get. And as you were saying, um, Bill, that's the uh, the larvae worm type. Um, product that you would use maybe over the permethrins or bifenthrins but the, uh, the the BT will kill only worms and if you dust it right at the base uh, sometimes if you plant you know when you plant it if you put a little, little of that in, in the hole when you plant it they are very difficult to to control because as you say you usually don't see them you don't see the the symptom um, until the, the vine wilts and then you just pull it up and throw it away because it's really the bore gets into the the vascular system bores into the uh, the stem of the of the squash and it you know it does away well for lack of a better term it just does away with the the vascular system and it can't take up any water now so. it, it, it is when the squash vine bore is in there I mean is it eating for nutrients or whatever and it ends up killing the plant or is this just something that, that that they're doing i mean or are they they actually enjoying what they're eating and chewing on yeah and i'm not i'll be honest i'm not sure if they're actually eating on that plant or whether they're just boring and disturbing that uh, okay. because if it disrupts the vascular system and and disconnects um the vascular system then, then it, the nutrients can't be or the water mainly can't be taken up by, by the plant now whether they're actually uh, eating on it, I'll be honest, I'd, I'd have to okay. do a little well, research on that one. <laughs> I didn't know, I, I was just curious. But, uh, you, you know, you are 100% correct, you know. Uh, in the perfect world, you plant your garden today, you go back about six weeks later and harvest it, but you got to be out there a lot, you know, yeah. keeping an eye on, on this and that. And one thing that uh, I will say the people here at T.G. Brooks Company are extremely knowledgeable. Um, if you have, you know, some bugs or something in your garden, uh, you can take them up to the extension office and they can identify them. Or if you bring some out here to T.G. Brooks Company, they, they can, you know, identify them and advise what you need to get rid of them. Uh, plumbing supplies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just T.G. Brooks Company, Serves a lot of different people, and uh, y'all carry uh, well, wa well water pumps, the wire, uh, pretty much anything that you need, the pressure switches, and all. I and just looked over and saw step-in post. I didn't even know y'all had step-in post. That's, uh, that's that's awesome. Yeah, well, you know they're handy. Yes, they are. They, I really. mean, they're temp. They, I call them kind of temporary posts. Yes, yeah, sir. But they are handy to put in. They're a lot cleaner than driving one in the ground like a, t a steel teeth. <laughs> yeah. Post. But I mean, not as sturdy either. But you got a little small area you want, and even around a garden, it's not a bad thing to use and, yeah. and run wire around it because, you know, the insects are a problem. The deer, the <laughs> groundhogs, the and the squirrels are sometimes <laughs> worse. I mean, how do you keep a squirrel I, out? You got me. I, I, have, mean, I have had so people. Uh, the last couple of years especially you know, deer you can put up a fence you yeah. can you can try to put squirrels i mean you can't you can't put a, squirrel, a fence up high enough to keep a squirrel no, and they they, just, they will work over your tomatoes yes sir and i don't even know if they would want to eat them i think they just want to take a bite out of them and <laughs> knock them off the bush that, that and the pears pears yeah. are bad they, but, uh, they, well you know a lot of times they they like to get to the seed uh, uh, of the pears and things, I guess, some, for some reason. Yeah, but. yeah, and the apples, they, they, we had some apples at the house, and we, I don't think we got any apples on last year. Squirrels ate them all. I'm glad you mentioned that. We, let's talk about fruit trees. Uh, you have to spray your fruit trees with uh, fungicides. Is that right, Johnny? Uh, usually fruit tree sprays are a combination of fungicides and insecticides. Usually it's going to be a combination of the two. Is that something y'all have here, B? We should have the fruit tree spray. Yeah. Yeah. Usually going to have Captan and Malathion yeah, right. or Carbol. Normally it does a little bit of everything for that tree. And, you know, every year is different. Some some reason, some years, the fungus, on, particularly on these trees, it gets is a lot worse than others. I've 
I imagine it's got something to do with the cloudy weather, the rain, like everything else. Right. Fungus gets on. It's been a good fungus year, believe me. But uh, well, and, and and also I believe that I remember Johnny saying, and also Carl Cantalupi, that it depends on your weather as how often you need to spray. But now it is possible if you spray too early that you can cause problems. Is that right, Johnny? Or am I getting that well, confused with, the with fruit something trees, else? Usually the fruit trees, especially apples and pears, there's a schedule in the bottles usually will have that schedule on there. And it has to do with bloom. Uh, the, 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 at, at a certain bloom stage, you start the spray. And then um, at, at a pink stage and then full open and then petal fall. I think it's like four different stages. And it's usually related to the bloom of the... Uh, pears, I mean, uh, um, pears not normally that, that big a problem. It's the peaches and the apples. Um, you really have to keep that spray regimen uh, throughout to, in order to keep having problems later on because uh, the, a lot of the diseases, a lot of the insects will get on them early and then the, the symptoms don't show up till later on in the year, brown rot and things like that. So you really have to stay on a, on a schedule for those. You know, a lot of the insects, uh, going back to vegetable garden, until you see that insect, it's, it's no need to, to do a lot of spraying because um, the, the, most of the products aren't going to be uh, systemic. In fact, there's no, I don't know of any uh, systemic products labeled for vegetables. They're all going to be contact. So until you see it, it's no need to, to spray it. But for the, for the fruit trees, there is a schedule that you need to keep um, uh, and spraying those and spraying them uh, early is, is the key. Uh, and continuing through the bloom stage at least. Um, and then you have the, you know, your cedar apple rust. I was at a, a property, I guess it was later, earlier this week, um, that some of the cedar apple, uh, the, the fungus that's on the cedar trees are really beginning, they're beginning to um, swell up and they're gonna be putting out those spores for the cedar apple rust that will get on the apples. And this is a, a fungus that overwinters on the cedar tree and then over summers on the, on the apple tree and then goes back to the cedar tree and it's just a back and forth. Um, and so you can, really it doesn't affect the cedar tree that much. Um, they're sort of a cool looking uh, little, <laughs> little thing on the cedar tree, but they, on the apple tree, they can really uh, spot up your leaves. And so when you that start, that, that spore starts coming out on the, um, uh, the cedar tree, that's when you need to start spraying your apple trees for that. Once they're gone, there's no need to spray for that particular fungus anymore. Right. So. Uh, Bill, as far as this time of the year, uh, what else does uh, T.G. Brooks really have going on that, that, that the listening audience could, could use well, and, and enjoy? Our, our mulch and pine needles when we have them, <laughs> which has been a tough job to keep in this year. And we got a load in yesterday about 10 o'clock, and at quarter after 11 we were out. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's so set them off of the set them off of the delivery truck you know, we onto the customer truck. We had truck. people got here and waited an hour for that truck to come in. Wow! Uh, seriously, yes. so it's uh, it's kind of like you, the luck of the draw to get them right now. And I guess everybody wants them at one time. Not as many people are selling them. I hadn't really heard of a pine needle shortage, but I do know that I understand that quite a few people that were in that industry which is a lot of center down there around Carthage and Southern Pines and that area in Sanford, have gotten out. Oh, really? And so I think maybe that's what it is. And, uh, but it's less than, it's, it's just less people sell them, I think, too. And, uh, but, it, you know, the mulch has been good. We're in right at wide open in mulch season. And there's still some some loans. We're still selling a little bit of loan fertilizer. It's, it's, peaked out by far on that and we also you know because of the new construction going on and that's still pretty pretty strong they're they're having to do these loans to get a co so we're just about do, doing it year round you yeah know, to get that done so if, if someone is in need of fertilizer for the garden or the loan y'all have we that and uh um, lime you know so we we can take care of most of all those needs right there and uh we have bag soil we have bag compost uh we have the peats products which are a lo local North Carolina product and uh, in their planting potting soils and manures and they're really good products uh, so you know we can we can find you something I think that'll grow something also uh, for those folks that uh, want a ice cold beverage 
You've got, you know, plenty of snacks, cold drinks, and you have a good selection of craft beers here, That's correct? Right. Yes, sir. The craft beer industry has really mushroomed over the years, I guess. As I tell everybody, you can't, you just can't shake a stick at the amount, amount of brands out there. They just keeps multiplying and multiplying. I thought the uh, soft drink industry was really bad about that, but I think these, the craft beers, is, they change every year. So I mean, you, you know, it's, 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 it's a really neat industry. It is, and it's a lot of it is local. You know, a lot of it is local stuff. And they, yeah. they're actually selling, bottling, canning, and and selling to the. Uh, for us to retail, so it's a, it's a neat industry, it uh, is. Speaking of that, I think there's a uh, a brewery down in Chatham County that makes pawpaw beer. Pawpaw <laughs> beer, wow. <laughs> I remember our discussion on pawpaws that time, yeah. How about uh, that? Yeah, that would be interesting yeah. to try. Yeah, that would be an interesting one. But they, if, you, if they can think of a flavor, I think they'll make it in the beer now. <laughs> That's very, very interesting. Well, look, we're going to get a word on for Rusty Wagoner with uh, – Linda Turf and Tractor up in Burlington. If you're looking for a Kubota tractor everywhere from an excavator to a skid steer to a generator, a tractor or more, contact Rusty. He's got some good deals going on. Here's more information. One question. Yes, sir. Fungus. I, you can look at it out there at my, my dad's house, the driveway, I, and we've got it several different places. The old black, I, it's a black fungus that gets in the gravel. It's a Gnostic algae, I think it's And it, I'm, most of the time, you'll notice it's kind of going to be in a shady spot. And I've sprayed some of the fungicide stuff that we sell, and it'll make it a little sick, but it really hadn't knocked it out. Yeah. So I googled it online, and they were suggesting spraying it with bleach. He's asking again. I didn't want to say yeah, that on the air. But yeah, yeah. Okay, um, all right, I, good, I, good, I good. It's growing big, but they're just not getting it right. So, what did he it, texture? It's, a, it's texture an algae type, it? so it's an algae we're, side we're rather than a fungus. That, that, that would do it. Soft. And a lot of times it's, it's, about the water it dries up, it goes away anyway. Okay. It's been so wet. Well, it's been a difficult year. Good deal, good deal. But there is a, and I cannot remember. Got the ESA alert going off. I've got a document. And I'll look it up before right. I leave to, to tell yeah, you. I cannot remember rusty. what that product is that you spray on it. But uh, I've sprayed that driveway and a couple of other that we've got. Got the emergency alert. They call them for snow, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it just it helped, but it really didn't. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah, yeah. We're back at T.G. Brooks way. Company. Hold on before you go, Bill. Hold on before you go. Uh, got a question for you, Johnny. And then I'm going to ask Bill something. Last week, we had a gentleman contact us at the radio station and uh, Gary Cross was on the program with me and the question was he grows some really big nice watermelons but they never get ripe have you ever heard of such they never get ripe huh how about you I Bill don't, I, don't... I know some of them don't really turn red and they are ripe I've heard of that yeah uh, I think some of them are kind of a light pinkish color that look like they're not quite ripe to harvest, and they say that's they're mature. But I, and I can't remember the name of that either. It's one I don't think we've ever sold. But I, you know, you hear a lot of stuff. Of yeah, different and things they've got the yellow stuff. ones, the yep. yellow ones, and everything. So right. gotta, you know, but if he over, if he cut it and it didn't, it just didn't taste good. Didn't have the sugar content. I don't know. Um, you know, pollination issues are going to affect the size or the, the shape of the melons but uh, as far as the, the, the not ripening i don't i don't know as long as the season you know was long enough for it to, to, to do that i i don't know you stumped well, me rob well i, I don't know I the, that's the, hard to the, do the gentleman just, contacted <laughs> us last week and kilby just reminded me of the question but uh it, anyway do, do you all sell watermelon and cantaloupe plants mm -hmm. uh do, what what variety do y'all use to I try to carry right them? right now we've got – actually, I don't have just a few right now. It's kind of early. Right. Because, I think. Yeah. And you said yeah, that in its wind. I know it is. <laughs> but uh, normally we'll have the Jubilee, which is a full-size watermelon. We carry a lot of the Crimson Sweet, which is a really good watermelon. Uh, the Sugar Babies. Which is a little small watermelon. Oh, delicious! That I love the watermelon. Just got those doggone little seeds in there. 
Uh, you know, it's an interesting question, Rob, because I had people say, where can I get seeds to seedless melons? And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know if I can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know? They well, do have them. They, uh, you have to have a pollinator for them. Yeah. Well, I was getting ready. I was thinking, and I was going to ask if you had any seedless watermelon plants. But it seems like, Johnny, I have heard you say that if you order a pack of seedless watermelon uh, seeds, that one of those seeds is going to be a watermelon that has seeds in it to cross pollinate. Is that right? Usually, you want a you want a, a variety that does have seed to plant with your your seedless ones uh, for pollination purposes. And there's a ratio of how many you need. Not you don't have to have it one to one. But uh, certain ratio you have to to get the pollination you need for the seedless watermelons because the the, um, the the seedless watermelons and and I'm, I'm beginning to step out of my comfort zone as far as uh, speaking of the genetics but they're they're triploids rather than diploids and and uh, uh, if we could call Carl Cantalupe he could explain it right I, fast I know, to us <laughs> of what that difference is anyway I like watermelon. But I love watermelon rind pickle too. So. Oh, good gracious. Uh, now, talking R about. Green tomato <laughs> pickle is good too. It That's sure good. is. <laughs> Some people call it, uh, I've heard people call it green tomato ketchup, chow chow. Oh, yeah. All that's yeah. good. Now, let's talk a little bit more about tomatoes. Since Johnny loves them so good, we want to put a lot of attention on the tomato today. <laughs> you have. Green tomato. Pickles. There you That's go. It. <laughs> it's, what is the two varieties? Is it determinate or oh, an indeterminate? Explain the two differences. One means. One's determined and one's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty good. <laughs> One gets right, the whole plant gets ripe about the same time, and then the other one just, you know, yeah, yeah. goes through, you know, a period of having green to ripe tomatoes, yeah. correct? Yeah, it, the, your determinant varieties are gonna uh, stop at a certain point. They, they, they stop growing, because the tomatoes, they, they set fruit low first and they go up the plant as, as, uh, as the plant grows. The determinant varieties get to a certain stage and they, they stop growing, so therefore the fruit will stop. Indeterminate continues to grow through the season. The plant will continue to grow and you continue to get the fruit uh, so your indeterminates normally get your indeterminates going to usually be a, a, a taller tomato, going to be a bigger tomato because they don't they don't stop growing. Your determinate ones stop at a certain size, uh, and so your fruit will stop. Is it safe to say that most of the varieties of the, the tomatoes that are here today are indeterminate tomatoes? I think most of the ones that are, that are here are. Um, your heirlooms we do have, uh, but are probably not. And some of your old style, what I call the old. Farm tomatoes, homestead, the homestead, bar globe, those. Yeah. But most of your. They your used to be. Uh, well, when I was growing up, you know, you used to hear about the bar globe and the homestead tomatoes. Does a lot of people still plant those varieties now, Bill? Bar globe is still pretty popular. Homestead, I don't even have. And, uh, but, you know, to what I remember about them. They were about the same, they were just about the same thing, in a way. We used to yeah. plant them and have a bed here, and we draw them. And I never, even, I didn't know which one I was eating, and, and still don't to a certain degree, <laughs> other than if it's a, a brandy wine or a German Johnson or something like that that does, has a di distinct shape to it. Yeah. But uh, most of the others, if it's round and red, I can't tell you from a better boy to a big boy to a celebrity. Uh, you know their performance makes the world exactly. a difference that's how they perform and, and a lot of times you know people will ask them what you know what's the best tomato in some years certain varieties of tomatoes do better than other varieties they do. so it's a good good idea to to sort of hedge your bets and plant you know three or four different varieties of tomatoes because one of those varieties will more likely do better than the other ones in my what little experience i know about it too i seem to think that most of your indeterminate tomatoes that one plant will produce more during the season than the determined tomatoes. It'll just, you know, you you can't hardly pick them fast enough off some of them when they really get to going. Yeah. And they continue. You can even have tomatoes to frost some years. And then some years you won't have them much after August. So, they just, so it's seasonal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. it makes a big difference on the season that you have. As far as how well, really, how, how well all your vegetables do. But tomatoes seems to be the, 
uh, really one that, that you know is determined by how what kind of season you have. All right, as far as other vegetable garden seeds here, whether it's uh, green beans, which I grew up calling them snaps. Uh, Still very popular. That's right. <laughs> Butter beans. Uh, got a good selection of those in stock. We've got, I think, five different green beans. Uh, what is Blue Lake, Blue Lake, Jade, Tenderette, and we've got the Roma, which is a flat snap, what I call it, yeah. And you say it's one called the Tenderette. Tenderette. Never heard of that variety. We've sold it for years. It's a really, it's a really good thing. Yeah, the, the Blue Lake, that's a stringless variety, correct? Well, I've always been a little bit confused on that because most a lot of them say stringless, but when you go out there and pick it, you got a string. And I don't think maybe it's not as much, but it's still a little string there. So. Yeah, and most of the varieties you mentioned are considered stringless. I, yeah. think. I don't know about the Tenderette, but uh, that's an older variety. But this is a, but yeah. Then how about cow peas? You got any? We've got the pink eye purple holes. And we've got a crowder, a brown crowder in there. And right now, I think that's all we've yeah, got. It's a little early yet for them. It's sometimes, the reason I ask is sometimes it's hard to find those. Uh, well, i kind of been telling anybody that comes in here, if you want purple hull bees, I would buy them. If you're not going to plant them, I'd go and get them. Because, yeah. you know, that was one of the first things to typically give out. Right. And that's kind of, the seed is kind of like the, everything else we discussed. There's not so much. They can't just go out and recreate another crop of seed, you know. <laughs> what they so, harvest last year is what so they get. Mostly what we get is already here. You know, you pre-book it, and you can fill in on certain. When he got crazy last year, I keep thinking about that. We sold sweet corn that I never heard of, and every week it'd be different. We were buying whatever they had in stock, and so, and I'm sure some of them were great corns, but we didn't know. What is this this week? You know, you know, <laughs> yeah. That's all we got. Send it. So, so <clears throat> last year, it necessarily may have not been what you wanted. You got what you could. We did, and we sufficed pretty well, mostly with the seed. The plants was a different, was a little bit different story. Where we went and sold out so early, and our supplier sold out so early, and we went for about a three and a half week period. And had just about nothing because they had to raise one more crop that they normally don't even raise. And so it was a big interval there. Well, well you know, uh, the Person County 4-H, I don't know if you've heard, Bill, but they're going to be having a multi-county poultry show in October. And anyway, uh, registration has stopped for it, but they had hoped to get the baby chicks in May but due to the hatcheries being so overwhelmed with orders, I think they have backed it up until June. But they're planning to have a poultry show here somewhere in Person County in October. And so it's no telling the amount of people that now have chickens at oh, home. Yeah. And, 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 and that's just the thing. These hatcheries, you know, they probably prepare for so many thousands of chicks and then you know after they sell out you know they're, they're out and it takes a while to get more so it's the case on everything we're going to get a word on for tg brooks company and we'll be back more with the gardener's corner here from tg brooks thank y'all very much thank get, you sir to see get up and go yeah <laughs> and look <laughs> We need to get Roy out here sometimes. Right. And also, uh, like the lady that lives coming. across the road from us, she works. She worked out of here at the hemp farm, but that shut down. But now she's working, I think, at Red Hawk Farms. Are you familiar with them, Bill, or yeah. Johnny? Red Hawk, Red Hawk. Sure. They, she says that they have got two acres of greenhouses and they're raising a lot of the uh, heirloom varieties of tomatoes. And she has brought us some um, just different color tomatoes and, so, and all of them. They're good, but they're in Hurdle Mills. I'm not familiar with it, but I, I might ride right by it. Yeah, 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 Red Hawk. I, I, Red, Red Hawk Farms, I think, is the name I of it. You company named but, Red Hawk, but I, don't, I think but, it was But they sell a, you know, a lot of different things to the... Uh, to, to, to the grocery stores, and which stores I don't know. Yeah.
I don't know. Um, but but it's something that can be something right there in your community, and you, if you don't know about it, you just don't know about it. Yeah, yeah. There is half a dozen or so operations similar to what you're describing around here that uh, are mostly a man's wife or whatever they raise and go to the farmers markets and do whatever. And I can't. And I think all most of them got a name they call it. But half yeah. the time I don't know the name. But I was like, oh yeah, I know you are. I yeah, think they, yeah, you know, yeah, I know yeah. where you live. Yeah, but, yeah. I think they can generate a lot of money at the farmers markets and things. <clears throat> yeah, the it's, greenhouse tomatoes do do well. They, uh, of course, Donnie Brooks of here he raises. Here we are back on the Garden Corner program, Mr. Johnny Coley is our guest today and uh, we're glad to be here at T.G. Brooks Company. Johnny, um, I know we've been talking about a different, a lot of different things, but I'm sure you've got some topics that you would like to uh, get some information to our listeners out here at this time of the year. So I'll just kind of follow your lead for a little while. <laughs> well, I didn't have a whole lot of things written down today, uh, Rob, but uh, we, we do have a, a, a program starting with the Person County Library and the Granville County Library System, uh, I think is going to join us as well, and maybe even tie in Vance and Warren before this is over with, but it's, you know, once a month, we're going to, every, every third Wednesday at 12 o'clock, we're going to have a, a horticulture program. Uh, we had one this week, which was the not the third um, Wednesday, it was the second Wednesday, but from here on, it'll be the third Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Um, and you can visit the website, the, the, the either Granville or Person County's website to uh, to register for these. Don't have the, the total um, layout of, of the topics yet, but there'll be horticulture products this week. We're talking about vegetable gardening, um, so you know be be on lookout for that and uh, register for that. It'll be everything on virtual. Uh, it will be on Zoom. Maybe you know this is going to go on through the summer and, and into the early fall. So we, you know, toward the end of summer, fall, we might be able to do some hybrid programming, uh, some face-to-face -face and uh, virtual uh, through Zoom. But uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, recently, uh, the last couple of weeks, we had a, a program on fire ants, and that was one thing I did want to uh, mention today. Was was fire ants? We we're starting to see them. More and more, this today, like a day like today, sort of puts them on uh, on on halt or on pause a little bit because of the cooler weather. But uh, they're still out there foraging. I've I've seen quite a few in our yard. Um, I made the comment one time. We had some a group of people out at our place to to do something, and uh, I didn't know where they were all from, so I just wanted to let them know that the fire ant heals you know, what they were, and you know not to disturb them. And I told them not that I wanted them. Uh, to not get bit. I just didn't want them to take any of our research projects away that we were trying to raise as many as we could on that property. Uh, and it seems like that is the case. Each year we have more and more of the fire ants. But the um, uh, there's lots of different control measures, and I want to emphasize the word control because you, we, won't, we will not get rid of these uh, insects. We're just going to have to control them in the areas that, that were maybe heaviest foot traffic. Um, and they can be a problem in the pastures as well, Rob. They it really is a uh, is a big problem because the the, the anthill in the pasture, the the cows or the livestock is going to uh, eat around it. They're not going to eat, you know, right there where it is. So uh, there's there's broadcast baits that you can put out where the baits they go and and get the the poison, the product, the pesticide, that, and and take it back to the um, to the nest. You know, killing the queen is the is the key to destroying the the nest. So you have to you have to get the queen. Um, and then there's drenches. You know, there are liquid drenches that you can use as well. Lots of different products out there. Just make sure you get the product that is suitable for your application. Um, if you're going to be doing it in your vegetable garden, make sure that label is labeled for your vegetable gardens. Um, and there are some products out there that you can use that for. Anybody that's you know, needs information on the different products. I'm not going to try to start naming off products on, on air, but um, anybody that's interested in, in needing for a particular application, let, let me know. Um, uh, Kim Woods, the livestock agent, also has information uh, uh, as far as the livestock aspect and pastures um, of how to get, get rid, of, rid of this this insect. But the, the they're becoming more and more, um, uh, I guess invasive in person right. county. Uh, they've, they've gone all the way to the uh, Virginia line at this point, so they're pretty much throughout the uh, person county. 
uh, area. And, you know, probably three years ago, nobody even knew about fire ants in, in Person County hardly. But uh, they, they've really started moving north. And, and Person County is not in the quarantine area yet. Now, a 2021 map came out, and um, it, it is they're not listed in quarantine. Granville County is. Granville County is in, in the quarantine area. Well, now, with, with that being said, what what does that mean, Johnny? Well, if you're growing plants, per se, like if you had a nursery or something, you would have to treat your plants if you're going to move them outside of the quarantine area. Uh, and most of eastern North Carolina is in the quarantine area. If, uh, uh, I, I can't remember exactly where that line is, but a lot of eastern North Carolina is in it. Uh, but if you're gonna, if you're moving stuff from the quarantine area out of the quarantine area, it has to be treated, um, and, and so not to spread the fire ants into the the non-quarantine area. But uh, so you just need to know where those where those are. NCDA has a map um, of that. If you just uh, googled NCDA fire ants, uh, I'm sure it would lead you to that uh, area that you could you would see the, the quarantine map um, and probably more information on, on what you would need to do in those uh, situations if you were. But, the, you know, not to say, because the quarantine area is not uh, to say there's no fire ants in the in the counties that they're, they're not uh, in the quarantine area. It's just that um, they're more infested in, throughout those counties. And we've been dealing with them in southern Granville County for a number of years. We've really had them for every, yeah, probably 10 12 years we've had them so control we'd love to get rid of them but 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 it's no way that's going to happen so we yeah. just got to learn how to control and yeah deal with them. yeah just try to deal, live with them and, and you know keep uh children away from them i mean they're, they're they're pretty bad when they get on you and they can they can hurt you um so just be aware of of, of what to look for they're they're going to be mounds and they don't have if, if you you look at a, a what we call a nuisance ant that those or other ants too uh, they'll have a hole at the at the top of their uh, their mound, <clears throat> and and that's an entrance and exit hole. The, the fire ants will not have that. They'll just it's just a mound of soil, and um, you disturb it a little bit, and they just come flooding Flying, out. Yeah, and wow. they're not they're not very big. They're about the size of a nuisance ant. They're not you know not large or anything. So but just they be aware can, they, of that. They, they pack a they pack a fierce bunch. Yeah, bite. Yeah, they yeah, sure yeah. do. And they grab you and sting you. So <laughs> it's hard to. Uh, we want to say a special thanks to uh, Dennis McDonald uh, coming in, operating the master controls back at the radio station. Uh, Conrad, he had to go for his COVID shot this morning, so Dennis, appreciate you stepping up to the plate and helping out. Uh, we're going to get a word on right now for South Boston Memorials, and we'll be back with more of the Gardens Corner program from here at T.G. Brooks Company, 411 Helena Mariah Road in Timberlake. Are you beginning look, to get in the sun? I'm gonna switch places. Yeah, look, look. <laughs> well, look, we knew you was cold, so Kilby got, got you a coat. I got you a coat in case you're cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, that would reflect the sun, too. That's <laughs> like one of those solar things. Yeah. Let's see you. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's Snapchat. Is yeah. That, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> Michelle comes in every once in a while, and the 4 H agent. She'll take a picture of me, and then she'll turn me into a girl and put a yeah. put a wig on me and all that stuff. So this is how you look. Hey, is girl. this Roy? Roy, look, if you want to come on out and be on the show with us, we'd love to have you. Hey, Rob. Okay, man. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Open. I tell you, the building industries. Look at that, I'm gonna make that my profile pitch on, on Facebook. There you go, man. There you go. What's your goal chain? What do they call that? My Boss. bling bling? Boss. Yeah. All righty, here we are back at TG Brooks Company. Rob Hall here with Mr. Johnny Coley of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service, where he serves as a horticultural agent for person in Granville Counties. Johnny, still plenty of time for folks to get there, 
free soil samples. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, samples. today is the 16th of April. Any idea what the turnaround time is? It is not very long. about a seven-week turnaround. Uh, so it's not a very long turnaround right now to, to get them in. Of course, be aware if you bring them into the office for us to take them in, they may not go out that exact day that uh, they they get in. Person County is probably a little bit better uh, than, than Granville County. Uh, Debbie usually gets out of Person County pretty pretty quick and probably is a, the same day. But um, but Granville County, we a lot of times we have to take them down to the to the lab. So if you bring them into the Granville County office, uh, you may want to allow a couple extra days to, for transit uh, for us. But um, but yeah, they're, they're free now. Started the 1st of April of being free. Um, so go ahead and get your soil samples in. Uh, even if it's, even if you plant your garden, uh, before, you know, you get your samples back, you can still a adjust the pH somewhat. Uh, you know, it's always better to, that you can incorporate it w whatever product you're putting in, whether it's a fertilizer or a lime, uh, it's better to incorporate, but, um, you know, if you can't, you know, getting the lime out there, it's going to take a little while for it to react and, and, and bring and affect the pH, but at least, you know, at least you got it started. Because the lime, you can really put out anytime. And even for your, your lawn, uh, if you want it, if you think your pH is off um, and you need to get some lime on it, you can put that out any time of the year. It's not, not any, any time of the year that you can't put the lime out, but you do have to be careful with the fertilizers and incorporating it help speed up the process of uh, the, the lime and the fertilizer, of course, taking effect. So just, just be aware of that. But get, yeah, get your soil test in and, um, uh, you know, get that. They'll be free until the end of November. Uh, so you got plenty of time to, to do that. Even if, you know, I tell people, if, if you're not going to do any fertilizing now, and it's a little, getting a little bit late for, for lawns, uh, especially your warm season lawns, and have cool, Sorry, your cool season lawns is getting right. too late to fertilize. Your warm season lawns, you can um, yeah. you start fertilizing pretty soon because uh, they're beginning to come out of dormancy. But <clears throat> the, the cool season lawns, go ahead and get your soil test, and you'll be ready for the fall to be able to put that fertilizer out that you that you need to, to put out. But yeah, that's a that's a big thing um, right now. With uh, you know, it, it's always hard to to plan, but it doesn't take too long to turn around, you know, seven days, you know, before you, you get those results. So a little while ago you said seven weeks, but you really meant I meant uh, seven, seven days. days. Did I say Come seven weeks? Come on around, Roy. Yeah, Come on through. Play, I appreciate you catching that. <laughs> yeah, seven days, seven days. One uh, week. Okay. One yeah. week. Yeah, anyway, uh, we want to welcome Mr. Roy Brooks to the broadcast. He's one of the owners here. And um, Roy is extremely knowledgeable about lots of things and I just had this thought a little while ago uh, some people may not believe that they were but those carpenter bee traps that you all have here they really will cut back on the carpenter bees correct Roy they do they do a great job and, and you know it's a it, the damage of carpenter bee looks intense and it is for a while but they aren't going to last but so long is the only good thing as far as people can be but they do a a lot of damage to woodwork well now uh when bill was on with us a little while ago we talked about you know the mulch and a lot of the different plants and you know some of the fertilizers he said that you all had a load of uh pine straw come in yesterday pine needles and he said about an hour after the truck got here y'all were out again so but uh well, it's a very unusual time. Uh, a lot of times, contractors and landscapers get started earlier in the season, and then they kind of move on down, and homeowners come in next, and, and it kind of spreads it out. It seems like this year it's been condensed here in about three weeks, and everybody wants to do everything right now. And there's only so many people that bail the pretty needles from Pinehurst, so they can only bail so many in a week. Yeah. So, It'll settle down and everything will be fine, Rob. Oh, yeah. Well, now, as far as um, uh, things that's in the store, I've got a good selection of hardware supplies. Bill mentioned you've got some pressure canners. So if it's somebody that's thinking about a pressure canner, uh, it'd be a good time to go ahead and get one because if they wait to canning season, you may not have them. Well, 
I think you're exactly right, Rob. And I think last year with the uh, COVID and everything that we had going on, it taught a lot of us many things. If you see something you want it and you're going to need it in the future, you should go ahead and buy it. I don't think we realize how slow the supply chain is going to be to refill for all products as we're all seeing missing items on shelves from hardware to housewares to building supplies. It's just a, a different environment out there to get products in to sell. Well, now, as far as your plumbing supplies and all that stuff, y'all got plenty of that stuff. I do today. You do today. <laughs> I've learned to say that in about the last 12 months. I, I've learned that quickly because, I, yes, we've had no problems, but you never know what's going to come out next week and not be available. Yeah. Well, now, I can't remember the answer to this question, but um, it seems like to me you told me that y'all can no longer get the White Mountain ice cream freezers. Is that correct? At this point, we cannot get any. What is it just supply and demand? That or? and they've been bought and changed a time or two, and it's just not in our chain of supply right now that we can get one. Really? Wow. Yep. Mm -mm. But they don't make quite as good ice cream as your ice cream maker, Rob. Well, you anyway, know, we need to don't... make some ice cream out here again. We sure do. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, uh, today, of course, it doesn't get too cold for ice cream, is my opinion. But today, it wouldn't probably be as quite as refreshing as it would well, be in July. Well, right here in this spot we was at, it wouldn't take near as much ice to freeze it. <laughs> but we need to do that again. Yeah, and yeah. sure do. Maybe get out here under the shed sometimes next time we're out here. And uh, I think all all that partook in it really enjoyed it. And so We got plenty of ice, Rob, whenever you get ready. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Look, we need to get a word on for fun wood auctions, and we'll be back to wrap up this special edition of the Gardener's Corner program. Thank you, Roy, for all y'all do for us at the station and all of Roxbury and Person County and the surrounding areas. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate we appreciate it. it. Oh, you said wrap it up. Goodness gracious, it is almost twelve. Yeah, it's ten minutes till, so. It don't take long when you have fun. That's yeah, right. A number. Somebody wanted something. Somebody wanted something. <laughs> Either to sell something or. Johnny, do you need any hay? I'm in good shape. We're in good shape. Well, yeah, we, I'll we see if you need some. Come on, I'll give you some. You got I got some? something I need to get rid of. Oh, do you? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Right I ain't going to say how some. good it is, but I think, you know, for cows and stuff. Yeah. Pastures are pretty good there. Pressures are greening up. We're still trying to just rotate them uh, and feed them a little bit of hay. I hate to put them out there on that grass that just goes through them so fast. Yeah. <laughs> Get them tightened up a little bit. Yeah. But they, um, yeah, we just we just fixed another area yesterday before we get on. How about the bees? Bees are doing good. We've got three hives. Look like strong. We've got three supers on. We've got supers on each one of the three hives. So hopefully we'll get those going soon. All right, here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program here at T.G. Brooks Company. Johnny Coley is our special guest. Um, Johnny, we've got maybe just about two or three minutes. I tell you, the, the, the hour flies by really fast, and we've been here about an hour and a half. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And it is already. really went by. Yeah, I couldn't uh, believe it was already time. You it, said wrap it up, and I said, what, yeah, wrap we, it up? <laughs> uh, it, 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 any kind of information that you – Want to pass along uh, points of interest and things that people need to be uh, looking forward to. Well, just you know, just keep an eye out for uh, programming through Extension. I know the the 4-H agent Michelle um, Van Ness and and Granville County um, Lana Howell. They're getting things ready for summer. Um, you know, it'll be summer fun here pretty soon. Uh, you know, they're they're working hard and just you know keep an eye out for the programming with. Uh, with the extension, uh, a lot of things going to be going on this summer, um, and, and 
Rob, I just wanted to make note. Uh, you know, I travel Granville in Person County, so 158 is, is usually the, the, the route I take. And that's one of the prettiest roads in, in North Carolina, I believe. Yeah. It's just all the spring flowers that are that are flowering. Um, you know, it, the dogwoods are, are really beginning to, to bloom out now. And, uh, of course, the red buds have been blooming and, and, and beginning to, to fade. And, um, the cherries, I'm looking across the street over there and, and seeing a, a pretty cherry tree. But on, on 158, there's a lady, or I say lady, it's, uh, I, I don't know who lives there. I don't know who, who it is. But they got a beautiful weeping cherry, one of the biggest weeping cherries I can uh, remember seeing. Because usually cherries don't have a long lifespan. If you have a big one, it's, uh, it's very good. It's, but the, it's a weeping cherry there that's just uh, gorgeous on, on 158. And, and all the azaleas now that are, that are blooming, um, you know, just... And, and to, to make note of azaleas, I usually recommend if anybody wants an azalea, a particular color of azalea, uh, buy that azalea when it's in bloom. So azaleas are beginning to bloom now. Um, so if you want a particular color, now's a good time to buy it. Um, just realize you're probably going to keep some water on it through the summertime. Right. Because, but if it's in a container, it's fine to plant it now. Um, but, you know, everything, all the, all, everything spring. And then the shades of green. Uh, that we have this time of year is always pretty. It's just a nice time of year uh, for the landscape uh, with all the different shades of green. Yeah, after a while, all the, all the green becomes, seems like one, one shade. It's all sort of the, the same color green, but right now you got different shades. And, uh, so just, beautiful you know, time of the year. It is a beautiful time of the year. And the pollen, we always complain about the pollen, but um, you know, if we didn't have pollen, we wouldn't have fruit. So that's we gotta, right, that's <laughs> right. We gotta have that. Everything happens for a reason. That's right. That's right. Well, look, special thanks to uh, T.G. Brooks Company for having us out, and thanks for that support on the program. We also appreciate Rusty Wagoner with Linder Turf and Tractor, South Boston Memorials, and Funwood Auctions. Also, I uh, want to say a hello to uh, Mr. David Bratcher. Mr. Bratcher wasn't able to be here with us today. He's taking care of business, but... Uh, we, we missed you, Mr. Bratcher, and yep. uh, anyway, but a beautiful day here at T.G. Brooks Company. We hope everybody has a happy and safe weekend, and we appreciate you tuning in to the Gardens Corner Program, and we'll turn it back over to Dennis at the radio station.